Minister and the State Department right now in the Pentagon is what that level of cooperation is, what will be allowed and what will not be allowed. But we should know uh, later this afternoon, the Pakistani government has said uh, they will announce uh, publicly what they are going to be doing. They will bring uh, basically the entire country into its confidence, uh, telling them up front what the level of cooperation will be with the United States. But the Pakistani president has a very difficult line to walk, uh, helping the United States into counterterrorism and keeping domestic situation at home calm. So we should know in the next couple of hours what those steps that the Pakistani government is going to afford to the United States if and when a military strike is involved, what will be allowed uh, to happen here and how the Pakistani government will assist the United States. Jim. Briefly, Tom, if the United States, if President Bush wants to build a coalition, is there any country more important than Pakistan? I think there's probably no country as important and as critical to any operation as Pakistan uh, because they indeed do have the best human intelligence on the ground because of the close ties with the Taliban. I think that uh, Saudi Arabia could also play a major role uh, in the Islamic world because uh, Saudi Arabia has experience in dealing with the United States. If the Saudis are seen to be on board and supposedly a Saudi diplomat is coming to Pakistan uh, today or tomorrow to meet with the government officials to, to discuss the level of cooperation. So uh, I think Pakistan is probably number one and Saudi Arabia is probably number two in the list of importance uh, to the United States in this coalition effort. All right, Tom Mintier, thank you for that update. And of course we will go back to Tom Mintier if there are any developments out of Pakistan on that issue of support. But for now we want to toss it back to Donna. Donna. All right, Jim and Colleen, thanks very much. As we carry on here, the world, much of the world, shares America's grief and it also shares its concern that terrorists can strike anytime, anywhere. Have the terror attacks shaken your sense of security? Well, taking your uh, questions and comments is MJ Gohill of the Asia Pacific Foundation. It's a London-based policy assessment group that focuses on security and terrorism issues. And you can start calling us back if you'd like right now. The number in the United States is 1-404-221-1855. Mr. Gohill, thank you very much for joining us. How strong do you think the, the, the cells and the networks of terrorists are around the globe? Um, I think uh, one of the uh, most important issues that has come out of this awful tragedy is the appreciation and realization that there is a network. Uh, uh, it's just not enough to bomb uh, one or two camps in uh, Afghanistan or dismantle the camps uh, and the madrasas, the religious schools in Pakistan. There is an international network uh, that stretches out to Western Europe and to the USA through affiliate companies, uh, through cultural organizations, uh, for the recruitment of both funds and personnel. Well, as you probably have heard, the president has said that uh, there will be no distinction between the terrorists and those who harbor them. Our Tom Mintier was just reporting from Pakistan that perhaps Saudi Arabia and Pakistan are two of the most important countries to get on board for support. Where do you think most of the terrorists are and who's important to get on board? Um, the, uh, the brain center for the terrorism is undoubtedly uh, in Afghanistan and uh, the recruitment is done through some of the madrasas. These are the religious schools uh, and there are several thousand of these in Pakistan. Um, the uh, terrorist groups at one time in the 60s and 70s the, were based in the Middle East, uh, but during the 80s the shift uh, has been towards Central and South Asia. Uh, the training, uh, the, 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 uh, the brain center is in Afghanistan. Um, but uh, the reach is all over the world. Um, the bombings in Africa, the attack on USS Cole. Uh, is an indication of the kind of reach that these groups have. And one is dealing here not just with one group, uh, one is dealing here with dozens of groups uh, with different leaderships. Uh, there isn't any one single leader. Uh, it, it's quite a big problem, this. Mm -hmm. Well, and as you say, worldwide reach, because as one of the diplomats was quoted on uh, a story today that I saw, never dreamed, or words to the effect, never dreamed that a terror attack like this could happen in the United States. Let's go to a caller for you, Tracy from Pennsylvania. Tracy? Hi. Go right ahead. How are you? Good. Go right ahead. Um, I was calling from Philadelphia. Um, my schools were closed Wednesday here, and I was glad to have them. Um, I was home with my son, by ourselves. Uh, just trying to explain to him what was going on. He, he just thought it was an accident. Um, he was just an accident, you know. How, how old is your son, Tracy? He just turned 11 in July. 
And was he worried? Oh, at first, no, because he thought it was an accident. Mm -hmm. You know, mommy, what's this accident? Mommy, what's this accident? What did you and explain then, to him? Well, how did you explain terrorism? Um, it's very, very hard. You can't explain terrorism to a child. Terrorism to an adult, we understand. We've seen Beirut, Lebanon. We've seen uh, what goes on in Iraq and Iran. But my child doesn't know anything about that. You know, and I'm trying to explain to him that some people were mad, uh, they were angry, they don't like how we run our government or how our government has influence on their countries. And he's still like, well, what? Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? He doesn't get it, mm -hmm. you know? What about that, uh, Mr. Gohel? How do, you, how do you explain that to a child or to an adult? How do you explain the mindset of a terrorist or of terrorism? Um, this is, I mean, uh, how, how on earth would you explain what's happened even to an adult? Uh, uh, I still am trying to reconcile myself with the horrific pictures that I've seen uh, since Tuesday. Um, uh, it, to put the whole issue in perspective, uh, America has been through two world wars but uh, did not suffer any attack on its mainland. And when uh, Japan, uh, the entire Japanese Air Force, attacked uh, Pearl Harbor on the day of infamy, uh, some 2,000 people were killed. Now here, on a normal day, without any declaration of war, without the use of any kind of uh, Air Force jets, uh, at least over 5,000 people have died. Um, it, the only way to understand this is to accept that you're dealing here with a group of people whose loyalty is to an ideology and not to any country. There is nothing tangible here. You can't negotiate with them because there's nothing you can offer them. It's not a territorial dispute. It's not localized. Uh, it's a battle of ideologies, a battle between a group of people who believe in a very fundamentalist lifestyle and who see the free world, the democratic world, and America as a leader of that free world uh, to be the enemy. Uh, it's a battle of ideologies. Let's bring in our, one of our international correspondents who's been in war zones before. Uh, Alessio Vinci is joining us, and he is in New York. Alessio. Well, yes, I am in New York, and I would have never thought of uh, covering a war zone-like situation in the middle of Ma Manhattan. Uh, it would, uh, it's really a situation that, we, I mean, we, you heard in the last hour or so, everybody talking about the war, about whether there should be retaliation, whether it should be strong or whether it should be measured. And it's quite incredible walking in here in downtown Manhattan and this in the area that has been sealed off by the police and by the army. Uh, walking around earlier this morning, for example, I was uh, going along an empty street and I saw a column of uh, military Humvees uh, driving by me and I certainly at that moment felt that I was back in Bosnia or in Kosovo or in Chechnya. Uh, and it was quite incredible thinking that at that moment I was on Canal Street in, in the middle of Manhattan. And as I'm speaking to you now, I'm hearing helicopters uh, hovering overhead. At uh, times there is a, a military jet patrolling, patrolling the skies. Certainly all situations that uh, we have been experiencing far away from the United States, namely in Kosovo or, or in Macedonia recently or, or in Yugoslavia. It's quite an incredible situation to be here in the middle of Manhattan covering uh, a situation that looks very much like a war zone. Alessio, I don't know if you had time to, to talk with people uh, where you were. I don't know if you were in Rome or where you were before you came to uh, New York, because uh, you're based, I think, now in Rome, but you've been certainly in Yugoslavia and in Bosnia. Did you have a chance to talk to people in Europe to ask them how they felt about an attack that happened on U.S. soil? Uh, yes, I have, and, and there are two things that uh, often come up. Uh, the first one is the fact that everybody recognizes in Europe that this is the first time, uh, as one of our callers, I believe, was, was uh, reminding us, that the first time that the Americans are suffering a, um, an attack on their mainland. And a lot of the people, especially, I must say, uh, some of the friends and the people that I know in Yugoslavia, are telling me, well, now the Americans, too, know what it means to suffer and to have victims, of course. This attack is of a completely different nature, and the, the sheer number of people who are believed to be dead, 5,000, I mean, we haven't had that number of civilian casualties throughout the entire Yugoslavia uh, NATO, NATO bombing campaign on Yugoslavia. So certainly, uh, you cannot compare the two things, but a lot of the people overseas are telling me that perhaps the Americans will start feeling a little bit about what it means to be the victims of such, of such an attack. But mainly what everybody's telling me is that, you know, asking me how are the Americans feeling, how 
are they coping with this? And, and, and uh, one thing I was noticing today uh, when uh, President George Bush arrived here to see all those firefighters uh, chanting USA, 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 I would have never really believed that something like this could have happened so spontaneously. Again, uh, covering uh, many wars in the Balkans, uh, how many times I've seen uh, hardline nationally Serbs uh, uh, chanting Serbia, 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 and I thought that was something perhaps a little bit negative, but in this case, to see this, this, this group of firefighters and rescue workers chanting USA, USA, and again, in the middle of Manhattan, I mean, it's, 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 I, I must stress this fact, and I don't know how many times I can really say it, to be here in the heart of New York and to, and, and to look at what's happening behind me, huge cranes, two collapsed buildings, two planes that collapse into it, it's just inc incredible. I, I myself cannot believe it. Are there some people, Alessio, who uh, does it make them more fearful that a terrorist attack could happen to them and, and what could happen now uh, on international soil as well? Well, you know, in, in Europe, especially in, in the 70s, and in, 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 there has been a lot of terrorist attacks in Germany, in Italy. So certainly right, people are, yes, and the airport in Italy, of course. So terrorism has struck Italy and Germany, um, and to some extent France, uh, and, and you know, every day in the news today. Take, for example, the bombing, the, 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 the what, what's happening in Macedonia or in Northern Ireland or in Corsica. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many, or in the Basque region. I mean, there are many areas in Europe today where uh, not this kind of attack again this is pro possibly the largest terrorist attack i think in in history i cannot imagine where one single attack has killed so many people so certainly the europeans are um, a little more familiar with what terrorism means uh, whether they're more fearful i don't think so because you know in this kind of situation usually the level of security increases and then the likelihood of a of a new attack decreases but certainly they are watching a lot more carefully about perhaps uh, where to where where to stay or, and especially in the areas where there is high risk of, of more more attacks and namely the airport for example mm -hmm. and we're looking at a live picture of the pentagon as we continue to, to uh, visit here this evening tom in new mexico is on the phone with us tom hi tom would you go ahead please are you there no no i think we're i think we've lost tom i'm sorry brian in chicago would you go ahead please i just um wonder say that I'm um, completely behind President Bush's campaign to approve the uh, $10 billion for the airlines and improving security as far as fortifying the doors, putting marshals on planes and restricting passengers from uh, ticket only places to kind of cut down on the traffic for the, you know, the security guards so they can do a better job mm -hmm. to uh, prevent this from happening. Mm -hmm. um, and no curbside check-in. That's one of the other new rules. Yeah, I didn't uh, completely understand the rationale for that. Because uh, I don't think they're matching, matching up passengers with the baggage. Well, I think that what they're trying to do is, is, is keep the baggage with the people and make sure that they're matching up. But they used to do that, I thought, at curbside, too, when you mentioned that. But that's one of the new rules that they want in effect. And so uh, that's one of the new ones that they'll do for security. Uh, Mr. Gohal, to get back into you, and we talk about some of these extra measures that are being talked about uh, for security at airports, what do you think needs to be done? Uh, what steps need to be taken to help root out uh, terrorists? Um, firstly, I think there has to be an international response to this. Uh, this is a menace that the entire world is facing. Uh, uh, America has suffered great losses uh, on Tuesday, but uh, terrorism has been uh, there in uh, South and Central Asia since about 1989. Um, and the irony is that a terrorist can only operate freely in a democratic society. Uh, the, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, it made the borders a lot more easy to cross, and uh, terrorists are now able to move around freely. Uh, they're able to, uh, a policeman, for instance, cannot stop someone unless, unless he has a warrant or he has reasons for suspicion. Um, and uh, there are so many buildings around the world, there's so many people uh, all over the world. Uh, how does one protect every single individual? But some steps can be taken as far as airlines are concerned. Uh, one thing that could be done, it may be difficult to do, is to prevent any kind of access from the passenger area into the cockpit area, even if this means uh, creating a separate entry and exit for the cockpit crew, so that there is no way uh, an aeroplane can ever be used as a missile as it was done. Um, other than that, it's a question of rooting out the terrorist network. Uh, it's a question of pursuing 
these people wherever they are and uh, eliminating and eradicating the training camps, the infrastructure and the leadership and for this the entire international community will have